Submarines have always been shrouded in secrecy. Their movements mysterious, their capabilities undisclosed. Unseen, unheard, undiscussed. The principal weapon of a submarine is stealth. Nobody can hear it, hopefully. Nobody can see it, certainly. Stealth, coming up and surprising your enemy before he has any idea you're there. This is the USS Georgia, an Ohio-class ballistic missile nuclear submarine. It is submarines like this which defined the balance between the superpowers throughout the Cold War. That era may be over, but their purpose has not changed. The Georgia contains more explosive power than has ever been unleashed in all of history. More than a thousand Hiroshimas in one steel hull. They call her a boomer. She is also the longest submarine in the world. But if the ocean were transparent, this is what you would see. Like her sister ship, Georgia, the Alaska is more than four stories high almost two football fields in length. And when she's submerged, she displaces more than 18,000 tons of water. The hull is built on an enormous scale, but for a very good reason. It's designed to hold 24 Triton ballistic missiles, each one 40 feet long and capable of carrying up to 14 independently targeted nuclear warheads. The missile deck. The crew call it Sherwood Forest. Everything on the submarine is designed to maintain the well-being and readiness of the missiles inside these tubes. They are monitored around the clock. Fortunately, the missiles are comfortable in conditions which also agree with their guardians. Petty Officer Second Class James McCune is doing his daily run around Sherwood Forest. It's his way of keeping fit during a three-month patrol while they are constantly submerged. 19 times around the tubes is one mile. 435 times a marathon. Keeping these missiles in a state of constant readiness is the ultimate responsibility of one man. At 49, Captain Richard Raz is one of the US Navy's most experienced submarine commanders. I always tell my crew, guys, if I don't chew on these, I'll be chewing on you. So they don't complain too much. I have reformed the modern Navy. I don't smoke below decks. I only smoke outside. And that's pretty infrequent in a submarine, once every 100 days. <laughs> the purpose of a boomer is to provide strategic deterrence for the United States. My mission is actually quite simple. Be ready to launch these missiles when directed with little or no probability of anybody's interfering with that action. We do that by remaining undetected, at sea, covert, unlocated by anybody. The whereabouts of Captain Raz and the Georgia may be unknown, but they're certainly not alone out there. There's a similar submarine hiding in the ocean and it's even bigger. Captain Andrei Zhigulyov drives the biggest submarine in the world. Well 
Welcome to the Typhoon, pride of the Russian fleet. An awesome submarine. She has two of just about everything. Twin hulls, two nuclear reactors, two propellers, and 20 ballistic missiles, which can also hit their targets from anywhere in the world. Her name is still a state secret, even though the two navies are opening up to each other for the first time in 50 years. Look at this. It's a big devil. It's twice the breadth, almost, it's 75 feet across, compared to 42 for Trident. I exclaimed in a rather profane language about what type of a mountain it was. This was in interpreted to the Russians who roared laughing. That's the captain, 39 years old. He had been skipper of this ship for three years and expected two more years, the son of an admiral. And all he had ever been in, in his whole time in the Navy, is nuclear missile, as he called them, submarines. The decision to employ ballistic missiles is taken at the highest level by the country's president and government. I am prepared to carry out any order given by my government. In my mind, the Russians, in spite, decided to build the biggest damn submarine in the world. We had one that was so big, they'd go bigger. Despite arms reduction, the Americans still have 18 Ohios and the Russians six typhoons. But both have many other ballistic missile submarines. The figures are chilling. Mutually assured destruction. It is the basis of deterrence. I assure you that if the president and the national command authority direct me to launch these missiles, they're going to fly. Once the Georgia submerges and goes on patrol, she will not surface again for up to three months. She will spend her time avoiding any contact, her precise whereabouts unknown, even to United States forces. As deep as a thousand feet, the submarine is deliberately cut off from the world. Communication is mostly one way. The submarine awaits orders from the National Command Authority, but seldom responds for fear of betraying her position. The crew remains on constant alert, ready to launch the missiles within minutes of receiving an order. Con radio emergency action message is an authenticator test. Recommend alert one. Radio con I. Once an emergency action message is received, it is passed to two officers who must decode it together. Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. To do so, they must get sealed codes from a safe within a safe. Only a few officers know the combination of each safe. No one knows both numbers, which are never committed to paper. Authentication required. Okay, we need to get the authenticator out of the safe. You'll have to leave, you're not authorized to be in here while the safes are open. No one, not even the captain, is allowed to be in this room alone, ever. Captain, we have a properly formatted emergency action message. Quest mission to authenticate, sir. I concur, sir. Authenticate. Authenticate, I, sir. Authentication is... Four officers Alpha, must now agree if the codes Charlie, match those Delta, on the message. Echo, if Bravo. so, they know a launch has been ordered. Delta, Charlie, Bravo, Alpha. Sir, the message authenticates. I concur, Captain. Message is authentic. I concur, Captain. Officer Dick, man battle stations missile for WSRT, spin up all missiles. Man battle stations missile for WSRT, spin up all missiles. 
The captain places his launch key, also kept in the safe, around his neck. Watch them get alarm. Captain alarm, I sir. Weapons Con, the following missiles will be released, 1 through 24. Weapons Con, the following missiles will be released, 1 through 24, I see. Weapons Con, the following missiles will be released, 1 through 24. Set condition, 1 SQ for WSRT. Captain issues launch Captain. orders, which are repeated exactly by the executive officer. The weapons officer must recognize both voices before continuing the procedure. Simulate pressurizing, release two. Ordered launch step. Simulate pressurizing, release two. Ordered launch step. Weapons gone. Simulate pressurizing, release two. Ordered launch step. Inside this safe is the nuclear weapons trigger, the final link in the launch circuit. Navigation fast control check completed satisfactory weapons con eye. Check completed satisfactory weapons eye. Navigation fast control check completed satisfactory Each step of the procedure is dictated strictly according to the launch manual. Nav con eye. Weapon system condition one is Q. Very well. The captain inserts his key, giving the final signal to launch. Weapons con, you have permission to fire. Weapons con, you have permission to fire, I sir. Weapons con, you have permission to fire. When we're on patrol and we get messages in of an alert one, it's something that happens all the time. We get them all the time. You never know. Is this the real one? Is this just a, a training one? Uh, fortunately, you know, we've had all training. You know, we never know when the real one's going to come. But we're out here. We're pretty isolated. Supervisor, initiate countdown. Initiate countdown, all right. To note one, to note 13. We go through the motions because um, history has shown that you fight the way you practice. So if, um, if the world situation were to change, you'd see a big change in the attitude of the crew, but we'd still do what we were trained to do. If it was for real, it'd be probably a lot quieter, a lot more tense. It'd go the same way, though. Prepare one. Prepare one. No one wants to destroy an, a whole civilization or the whole planet because I think we all know that that's what it would come to if we launched all our weapons. But in order for deterrence to work, we have to be willing to do that if we're called upon by our government to do so. And I believe most, believe all of us are willing to do that. Get on two. Get on two. We've been trained, so we do our job like we're supposed to, and. Hope our government knows what they're doing. Ten. One away. One away. If the firing trigger has been closed and the missile has started a launch, I cannot stop it, and it cannot be stopped en route to the target. Those missiles will arrive, and they will detonate. Thirteen away. Okay, it's not like a movie like Dr. Strangelove where some computer's making a decision. All of the people involved with the handling of these weapons are carefully screened, carefully monitored, continuously evaluated for their performance, for their stability. And I have to tell you, at the first sign of a weakness, uh, we remove that individual from their responsibilities for the weapons. We are not obligated to uh, allow someone who's having a bad day to continue on. Even if the individual who was having a bad day was the captain, I cannot get to a missile alone. I cannot even get to my launch key alone. My superiors, my executive officer, 
my weapons officer, my whole crew would know that something is wrong. They all have to participate in the sequence to launch. I can't do it alone. Today, the submarine is linked with nuclear deterrence. But long before nuclear weapons, the submarine itself was a deterrent. Like a shark, you don't have to see it to believe it might be there. This doesn't look much like a submarine, but in fact, well over two centuries ago, it was able to make the very first submarine attack. It was called the Turtle and was used to strike at the British fleet during the War of Independence. It was primitive and dangerous, but its inventor was on the right track. There was a valve here for flooding the main ballast tank under us with water and diving the boat. There was a pump here for pumping the ballast tank out again and letting her come up. The propulsion was by uh, the pilot, a one-man boat, of course. The pilot sat and pedaled these pedals here, which in turn rotated the propeller. Quaint as it might appear, the turtle was designed to sink a ship. And for that, it had an extraordinary weapon system connected to this pointed screw, or auger. Now, you see a sort of pointed thing at the top, like a, a screw. And the idea was to get under the ship he was attacking and drive home this auger. He had a lot of work to do. Into the wooden hull above, because, of course, they were wooden ships in those days. And to that auger was attached a delayed action mine. Although the attempt failed, a potentially lethal threat was born. It was the first idea of submarine deterrence. That is, that a very small, underwater, covert threat could scare the pants off a very much more powerful fleet. The idea of traveling underwater has always been associated with deviousness and stealth. Even Leonardo da Vinci is said to have refused to commit plans for a submersible craft of paper because of the evil nature of men who practice assassination at the bottom of the sea. Small wonder that early pioneers had to combat the belief that undersea warfare was immoral and reprehensible. Way back in 1898, John Philip Holland, the father of all modern submarines, uh, was attacked by Dame Clara Barton, the, the uh, founder of the American Red Cross, when she looked, saw around his little submarine. Uh, and she said, Mr. Holland, you created the most dreadful weapon of war, and went on to say how ashamed he should be of himself. And he said, Madam, on the contrary, uh, I have created the device whereby war may be prevented. Uh, today, he would have said deterred. With idealistic names like Protector and Peacemaker, inventors tried to improve the submarine's image. But in two world wars, it was to prove a far more effective assassin than Peacemaker. Propulsion was no longer by pedals, pumps, or in one case, rubber bands. As Jules Verne had predicted with his mythical Nautilus, electricity was the key. It was stored in batteries for use when submerged, but the early engines which generated it were clumsy and dangerous. What was to transform the submarine into such a potent hunter-killer was the reliability of the diesel engine. We're in the engine room with these two gigantic diesels. Uh, here are the starting controls and, and speed controls. And you can only run these diesels on the surface or snorkeling because they use a lot of air. And where you and I are standing now, we'd be in a howling gale if we were running these gigantic rock crushers, as they're called. You can see why. They look pretty crude, but they're rugged. And they can be mended at sea. We have to do our own repairs. There's no garage to stop in if you're 5,000 miles from home. And you have to be very quick on shutting these engines down uh, if and when you dive. You've got uh, perhaps a couple of seconds, no more, to shut these valves, otherwise water comes back in. And that's very bad news to the engines themselves. Very noisy engines. They make me deaf anyway. I can't hear a thing above a 1,000 hertz. But when you're dived, you have to go to main motors supplied by the battery. That doesn't use any air. So you go to main motors. These look very crude controls by comparison with a modern press button affair, but they're solid. You know exactly what's going to happen, and they're not going to jump out under a depth charge attack.
For both world wars, submarines were no more than submersible torpedo boats. Let's compare those diesel electric submarines with whales. Now we all know that whales have to come up to breathe and also to vent their fowling. Now, a nuclear submarine is not a whale at all, it's not a mammal, it's a true shark. At Groton, Connecticut, a new naval era dawns with the launching of the Nautilus, one of the largest submarines ever built, and the first atomic-powered craft in history. It may well initiate a revolution in naval warfare. Mrs. Eisenhower christens it with a valiant blow. The nuclear submarine was a technological revolution. Greater mobility was the perfect weapon in an uncertain world. Fear and suspicion dominated east and west. Each side convinced the other was plotting its destruction. heralds a new era of the atomic age. I'm no communist, and I'll tell you that right now. I believe a man should own his own house and car and cow. I like this private ownership, and I want to be left alone. Let the government run its business, and let me run my own. Fear of the bomb led to hysterical propaganda. Be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. And cover. That's the first thing to do. Duck and cover. And cover. First, you duck. Duck. Then you cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and 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 you Duck and cover. How far do you have to be from the blast to live through it? Well, let's take a 20 megaton surface burst. It was the atomic age, and the great symbol of progress was nuclear power. The U.S. Navy thought it might take 20 years to harness it for propulsion, but one man believed otherwise. Hyman G. Rickover has become an American legend. He only ever commanded an ancient minesweeper and never saw combat. In 1949, when he took charge of naval reactors, nuclear submarines were a futuristic dream. And yet by 1960, there were 13 in service and 35 more on the slipways. A speedster which will command a submerged 50 miles per hour, making it necessary for her crew to wear life belts during her... The magnificent agility performance of that submarine where you could fly in, almost fly in, it, it's what it was like, under aircraft carriers, match their speeds, or operate on the flank of a task force, picking the time and the place for your attack. You say to the crew, well, we'll wait till after the movie's over. USS Triton, the world's largest nuclear submarine. As well as speed and agility, nuclear power gave the submarine unheard of endurance. Captain Beach, who skippered the Triton on a course matching... The Triton was a brand new submarine. She had never been to sea. This was the shakedown cruise, and it was the shakedown cruise to end all shakedown cruises. And so, uh, you know, I felt we had really accomplished something. We'd shown that the nuclear submarine could do anything. It's Nautilus Day in New York, and the submariners who conquered the Arctic are cheered to the echo in their progress along the city's traditional route of heroes. Rickover won public and political support for his achievements, but his contempt for bureaucracy led him into constant conflict with the Navy. Admiral Arleigh Burke probably described the situation best with regard to Admiral Rickover. He said that the Navy could certainly only afford one anarchist at a time. Admiral Rickover was a gentleman who took no guidance from any Navy chief, no civilian secretary of the Navy, no secretary of defense, and no president. But his ruthless pursuit of excellence in what he saw as a mediocre world also left him isolated and loathed. I think he did it because of his personality, and that was the only way he could get the results that he wanted. But everybody who knew him hated him. Everybody was scared to death of him and when he laid out an order. You did it, because if you didn't, you got canned. And I mean it. He was very tough. For three decades, Rickover personally interviewed and approved every nuclear officer. For each one, it was an unforgettable event. 
I had you know, talked to many of the young lieutenants who were being interviewed by Rickover, and so I was perhaps more prepared for the uh, obscenity than most. Uh, it was a day-long interview during which uh, I was thrown out of his office on at least four occasions for insolence or, uh, or other answers that did not please him. The trouble with you is you want easy answers, but you don't know the proper questions. Why didn't you think about it at the time and start something? Well, unfortunately, the time that you started in nuclear power in 1946, I was being born. So um, I, I, I admit that I'm coming to the issue late, all right? But well, it's, you're it's the no rising Argument uh, with every answer, sarcasm in uh, great quantities, an effort to degrade, to humiliate, to uh, anger. And only Jesus Christ can do all of them. I can't. At the end of the interview, Admiral Rickover said, now, what are you going to say when you get back to your office? And I said, I'm going to say this was the most fascinating experience of my life. And he said, now you're being a greasy aide. Get out of here. Rickover's influence is still felt in every corner of the U.S. nuclear navy. Few dispute his engineering and safety standards, but some believe Rickover's dream was achieved at considerable cost. Admiral Rickover was the right man in the early years. I think that uh, the navy and, and individuals in the navy paid a fearsome price in later years, and there are many broken careers as a result of Admiral Rickover's uh, dictatorial uh, policies. I have to agree with a lot of those who say they don't like his methods, but man, you can't quarrel with the results. Ten years after Rickover's regime ended, nuclear submarines are still commanded by men he selected. And the Admiral slammed his hand down on the desk and he said, answer the question. And I said, yes, sir, I'm ready to go earn my living. And he said, get out of here. Quiet and control, four eyes on a Fairwater Plains, three up. 100 feet, sir. Here I am, uh, 20 years later, driving a nuclear powered ship. The nuclear submarine became the icon of the Cold War. Its greater mobility and endurance increased its stealth because nuclear submarines could hide anywhere. Previously inaccessible parts of the world acquired new strategic significance. Let's fold up the Mercator projections and look at the globe from above. And we'll see a huge, unexplored ocean right at the top, the Arctic. Look, it's bordered on the one half of the circumference by Soviet Russia and on the other half by Canada and Alaska. You can hide under the icy for a submarine and don't forget there's no other kind of vehicle at all that can get there. You can pop up through the ice and you can fire missiles from there to either side. Early submarine-launched missiles were short-range and had to be located close to the enemy's coastline. But today's long-range missiles can hit their targets from anywhere in the world's oceans. We're talking areas the size of states, huge pieces of ocean. I can go wherever I need to go at will, totally random, continuously ready to launch. Out of the 10 submarine Trident Force in Bangor, Washington, we uh, would have seven of them out on alert at a time. And on every one of those seven submarines, I have one missile, which would have three of its warheads saying, Moscow, Kiev, Leningrad. That's for starters, but that's on every one of the seven. The one in the North Atlantic, the one in the South Pacific, the one in the Indian Ocean, the one in the Gulf of California, the Great Lakes, wherever we want them. And in case you think you can do the job of surveillance detection to trigger destruction of submarines with IR, infrared, or laser, it'll be the one under the pole, too.
This container holds a Trident missile, or more accurately, since the Navy routinely neither confirms nor denies the presence of nuclear weapons, it can be assumed it does because of something happening two miles away. The Georgia is approaching the explosive handling wharf where missiles and torpedoes are loaded. But it's the convoy of heavily armed Marines that gives the best clue to the truck's load. When nuclear weapons are on the move, absolutely nothing is left to chance. This is the first move in the game. The players are scattered throughout the oceans of the world. The game is hide and seek, but it's a deadly version. When he submerges, Captain Shguliov will look for a quiet corner of the ocean to park his typhoon and hide. But from what? No missile can find him since his whereabouts are unpredictable. No satellite can see him. No laser yet invented can detect him. He is effectively invisible, except to another submarine. This is the USS Topeka. She's a Los Angeles-class fast attack submarine, a state-of-the-art hunter-killer. Unlike the hunter-killers of World War II, her principal targets are not on the surface. One of her jobs is to seek out enemy submarines like Captain Shguliov's Typhoon, and in wartime, destroy them. In the meantime, it's a secret war. There has indeed been a secret war. Russians versus the West, West versus the Russians. The problem is this. Submarines can't be seen, we all know that. The only way you can detect them is to listen for them. To listen for them with huge ears built into the submarine itself. Leonardo da Vinci once wrote, if you place the head of a long tube in the water and the other extremity to your ear, you will hear a ship at a great distance from you. In the Second World War, submarines were detected by bouncing sound waves off them. This is the principle of active sonar, but with it goes the risk of revealing your own position. Today, silent listening is the key. Passive sonar. Sophisticated arrays of microphones collect sound from all directions in the water, translating it into these visual displays. Interpreting this information is the science and the art of the sonar man. Now, there's many things in the ocean, and if a submarine is looking for its counterpart, uh, it's got to pick it out from every other kind of sound in the ocean. Now, there's the noise that whales make burping. There's a noise that sharks make slithering through the sea and flicking their tails. There's a noise that shrimps make making love. Snap, crackle and pop, as a matter of fact, it sounds like. There's a noise of the sea itself, of the seabed. There's a noise of merchant ships going through. And then somewhere in that, you hope to pick out the submarine that's stealthily making its way past you. That's the one you want to nail, because he's your real enemy. Each grain of green light represents a sound. The vertical lines indicate the presence of ships and submarines in the ocean. A highly trained sonar man can identify details such as how many propellers a contact has, how many blades on each propeller, and how fast it's revolving. One bears zero four two contacts making eight four turns on one four bladed screw. Well, how do you pick him out? And the answer is that you've got to fingerprint each of these separate sounds and keep them in some kind of library, just like the fingerprint library that the FBI or Scotland Yard keeps. So detailed is this library, a specific submarine can be identified by its acoustic signature. Recordings have been collected by spying on each other at very close quarters. During the Cold War, US and Soviet submarines played what are called cat and mouse games. An American submarine would be going near a Soviet port on an intelligence collection mission, and suddenly they would be spotted by the Soviets. The Soviets would send out a submarine, and they would engage in some sort of a confrontational maneuver several hundred feet below the sea. This happened on many occasions, and there were even some scraping of hulls. Uh, what we're getting is uh, 
some noise from it. In this secret war, a hunter-killer uses sonar to find its targets. A boomer uses it to avoid the hunter. Tactically, each must be as quiet as possible. This submarine is built with the finest technology available to make her stay undetected. Her acoustic signature is the quietest submarine in the world. The crew and the machinery inside it are essentially sound isolated from the ocean. The very decks we walk on are in fact sound isolated. I know that this ship is undetectable unless I do something frankly stupid. But when leaving port, any submarine is detectable by satellite, by underwater detection systems, and by hostile submarines lying in wait. The game of tag starts here. And to get the edge on your opponent, you have to find his blind spot. Only here's? Not if we stay in his baffles, see, Madam Beaumont. Not if we stay in his baffles. Come in behind his propeller, and he's deaf as a post. It is now second nature for any submarine commander to look over his shoulder. Each side has its own tactics to check if they're being followed. Now, the way the Soviets chose to do this was to turn around and go back at high speed, uh, hence the expression Crazy Ivan, because if there was somebody behind them, uh, the first thing the person behind them knew was that this, uh, uh, this um, submarine was racing back down the line at them. He turned on us when we weren't suspecting at one time, but we didn't come anywhere near colliding. Brought us a little closer than we wanted to be. Possible aspect change on target. Sonar con eye. Current possible target take based on bearing rate. Con sonar, crazy Ivan. You're playing a game a lot when you're out there. It's a serious game. He comes at you and you're heading at him, and who's going to turn first? And these incidents have led to real casualties and loss of life, according to reports in the Chicago Tribune. The Tau Tag had been trailing the Soviet missile sub for some hours. When the Soviet sub pulled a crazy Ivan, came hurtling back toward the Tau Tag at a fairly decent speed, 12 knots or so, we think. Um, the Tau Tag, for whatever reason, didn't get deep enough, the underside of the Soviet sub smashed into the Tau Tug's sail. The Tau Tug got knocked on its side. Crew members who were sleeping got dumped out of their bunks. Uh, lockers all opened in the kitchen. Jars of cherries splattered all over the place. Tools were popping out of lockers. In the sonar shack, the operators were listening at some point, picked up the sound that one Navy veteran described to us as being like popping of popcorn. And our people interpreted that as the sound of the Soviet submarine breaking up as it got into the, the uh, great depths in the ocean there. The Navy will neither confirm nor deny this report, and in the tradition of the silent service, refuses to discuss such issues. I, one, first wouldn't talk about any uh, encounters that I've had that are classified, and I'd like to shoot anybody who would. What they doing? Witnessing this scene, you could be forgiven for imagining that the Cold War is not officially over. But the so-called evil empire has disintegrated. According to its supporters, deterrence work, and the genie never left the bottle. There's a, an ongoing debate now about what is the future for the submarine force. The Cold War is over. The Soviet Union is gone. Weren't they the only enemy? One of the problems I have with that logic is 
there's still an awful lot of people out there who are not in any way, shape, or form friendly. The last four patrols this crew made with this ship, the following events occurred. The United States invaded Panama. Iraq invaded Kuwait. Desert Storm occurred. And then there was a little thing called the coup in the Soviet Union. Now, none of those events was very well predicted by uh, the opposition. Are we clairvoyant? Are we able to see into the future, to next week, next month, next year, the next decade, on when we're going to rely on our having these ships? these warheads still labeled Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev? For their part, the Russians have announced that they are no longer targeting U.S. cities. Request permission to come aboard, sir. Yes, sir. It's a real pleasure to be with you here today on this big ship. I've heard that the Russians have said that they're not targeting our country, and that's fine. I believe it. <laughs> All you have to do to target something is turn, make the decision. In 15 seconds, you can do it. The capability exists, and we have to deal in capabilities, not intentions. Dogs in the same litter fight. You can't change it. But the collapse of the superpower balance does raise questions about the continued relevance of nuclear deterrence with its crippling cost. The cost of Trident, the capital cost, is a stack of 10 pound notes, tidily, neatly arranged, pressed down, reaching 88.38 miles into the sky. Some believe the colossal cost of the ballistic missile submarine race also succeeded as a financial deterrent, hastening the economic collapse of the Soviet Union, crushing an entire social structure under the weight of its own armor. We would like to see this expenditure redirected towards the welfare of our people. We'd like to have peace, happiness, goodwill to men, and to beat our swords into plowshares, so to speak. When the turtle was peddled out into New York Harbor, its inventor could hardly have imagined that the principle he was demonstrating would one day have the capacity to destroy the entire planet. But in a fragmenting world, is there still room for this ultimate deterrent? Out in the oceans, today's submariners continue to do their job. I must assure you that if I ever have to go up against another submarine, I'm gonna win. And I'm going to win because I have the best ship, and I have the best crew, and I know how to fight a submarine. I've been trained that my whole adult life. I'm really good at it. Diving officer, surf the ship using high pressure air. Surface, surface, surface. While you've been watching this program, Somewhere, hundreds of feet beneath the ocean, the crews of the Georgia and the Typhoon may well have been rehearsing the launch of their missiles. They are out there now, maybe only a few hundred miles from where you are, waiting for the call.